Hoover Institution, uh, which uh, Guo Dai Jun has done a lot to help build, which of course follows on the work of my longtime friend and colleague, Ramon Myers. Um, <clears throat> so I think many of you know Dai Jun. I know she has a big fan club on campus, and much of it is here today. She has been for many years a research fellow at the Hoover Institution here at Stanford. She was a visiting lecturer at our Center for East Asian Studies in 2003, and she's been a uh, associate professor at the Graduate Institute of American Studies at Tham Kong uh, University for several years in the late 1990s. She served as press secretary to the President of the Republic of China uh, from 1990 to 95, and was also deputy director of the first bureau um, of the presidential office from 1989 to 1997, and director of the ROC government's information office in Boston in 1987 to 88. She's both a scholar and with many years of experience in public life. In addition to her <coughs> continuing historical research, and I'll tell you some of the things she's written about, she has been a very important person in assisting the Hoover Institution Archives to develop its modern China archives and, of course, its special collections, which include um, some very famous collections, the Kuomintang Party Archives, of course, the diaries of Chiang Kai-shek and Zhang Jingkuo, the personal papers of T.B. Sung, H.H. H. Kung, and other uh, Chinese um, leaders of the past. <clears throat> One of her major publications is about T.V. Sung. It's T.V. Sung in Modern Chinese History. Another is on Taiwan's economic transformation, leadership, property rights, and institutional change, which in some ways she'll speak to today. China's quest for unification, national security, and modernization. <clears throat> Breaking with the past, China's first market economy, and the power and personality of Mao Zedong. This talk is going to be very far from the power and personality of Mao Zedong, uh, because it's going to look at a different way, uh, and I think a more humane way to get to development than killing millions of people on the Chinese mainland. <clears throat> and uh, so we're going to hear about uh, Dai Jun's work uh, tracing Taiwan's early, the early roots of Taiwan's economic miracle. And the title of her talk is From Planned Economy to Market Economy, Taiwan's Economic Transition. I do want to say two things before I let you speak. One is uh, that two weeks from now, uh, on Thursday, November 29th, we'll have another seminar <clears throat> with two distinguished visiting scholars from Taiwan looking at the EC issue and Taiwan's maritime disputes. And the second thing is <clears throat> uh, she is recovering from a cold that kind of took a toll on her voice, so she's going to use the microphone, but speak relatively softly, uh, and that's often the way that the most profound thoughts are conveyed, so thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Professor Diamond and Professor Myers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, please excuse my voice. Um, it's actually much better than it is now. Uh, many people <coughs> took it for granted that Taiwan has always been a market economy, but the truth is not. Before 1949, Taiwan was a complete command economy with 76% of national resources, industrial commercial <coughs> resources controlled by state-owned enterprises. And I give you a quick glance of Taiwan's economic history. Before 18 95, Taiwan was part of Chinese Empire, uh, the Qing Dynasty. Mm. And after the Jiawu uh, War, between 1895 and 1945, Taiwan was occupied and became Japanese colonial. And Taiwan's economy was a colonial style enclave economy, which means the production <coughs> was to the need, to the support need of the Japan, the mother state. And with the victory of World War II, uh, in 1945, Japan returned Taiwan to the nationalist government, Zhonghua Mingguo. 
and Chiang Kai-shek appointed government general Chen Yi. He was governor <coughs> general in Taiwan. Chen Yi created a new command economy uh, with 75% of the assets controlled by the government. And in 1949, you all know that uh, Kuomintang, <coughs> the nationalist government, was defeated in mainland China. And Chiang Kai-shek and Kuomintang state and party moved from China to Taiwan. But Taiwan in 1949 was suffering from hyperinflation, falling production, commodity scarcity, <laughs> scarcity, and declining foreign exchanges. And the bank pays interest rate as high as 125% per year, but still no one wanted to deposit because inflation rate is much higher than interest rate. So, but how did Taiwan turn aside from the command economy and build a productive market economy? So our story begins with a new leadership, with the defeat in many China. Uh, there's a small group of leadership emerged. A small group uh, who are loyal to Chiang Kai-shek and who came together to endorse the belief of Kuomintang founding father, Dr. Sun Yat-sen's Sanmin Zhu Yi. The three principles of the people, especially the people's livelihood, Ming Shen Zhu Yi. Ming Shen Zhu Yi advocated restriction private capital while promoting state capital, Jie Zhi Si Ren Ziben. And these people, this small group of people, they were in their 40s and 50s and they were all well educated and most of them had studied abroad and had successful official careers. And there's a unique situation. There was a shared mantle of humiliation for this small group of leaders. Chiang Kai-shek and, and his followers, they, they have been suffering from humiliating of losing the Chinese mainland. So they were strongly motivated to, to avenge, to make up for their failure. Xue Zhi, Chiang Kai-shek in his diaries in late 50s and early 50s, and late 40s and early 50s, every day he started his diary with Chinese character, Zhi, shame, or Xue Zhi eliminating, wipe out the shame. <clears throat> so this group of people determined to make Taiwan an experimental incubator of the three people's principles, 三民主义的模范生, 建设台湾成为三民主义的模范生, so as to unify Taiwan and China in the not too distant future. So reform began with this small group of people and our research observed that a pivotal moment took place in the 50s. But let's look at the driving force, the key engines of the reforms. Chiang Kai-shek, you all know that. Journalism Chiang Kai-shek, he was then the chairman of Kuomintang and the president of the Republic of China. He was the most powerful figure. And he was also a strong a person with strong de determination. A person with strong perseverance, Chiang Kai-shek never yielded to difficulties or challenges. And Chen Chen, the person who just next to Chiang Kai-shek, and Chiang Kai-shek's long-time comrade, Chiang Kai-shek trusted him very much. Chen Chen was a leader of integrity and courage. Chen Chen was also a man of iron will. But Chen Chen had been very open to new ideas. And two technocrats, Yan Jiagan and CK Yan. Yan Jiagan was famous, known for his political wisdom and skills. He was eloquent but but very humble. And KY Yin Yin Zhongrong, uh, K, his English name is KY because his literal name is Guo Yong, so KY. KY Yin Yin Zhongrong was smart, creative, bold, and straightforward. Yin Zhongrong was always, he was very unique in Kuomintang government. He was always the pioneer, the initiator of new ideas. And he was also known as one of the largest, the biggest the reformer. <clears throat> in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and Chen Chen first set up Taiwan Shentan Shiye Guan Li Taiwan Production Business Management Committee. 
to manage Taiwan's state enterprises, which means the committee will take control of planning, coordination, and supervision of state-owned enterprises in Taiwan. And Chen Chen was the chairman. In Zongren was vice chairman. But Chen Chen was too busy with political affairs. So In Zongren was the person who was really in charge of this committee. And In Zongren, in Zongren made several decisions. First of all, among hundreds of things that needed to be done, In Zongren decided he selected three industries as winner picker, as winner picking to, uh, for government to support and to subsidize them. And the first one is, is electricity, electrical energy. And you, you all know the industry uh, needs electricity. And the second one is chemical fertilizer, because for farming, uh, for farming we need fertilizer. And in Zhongrong chose cotton textile as the so-called state subsidized <coughs> energy, a winner. That was shocked by most of the government officials because Taiwan didn't produce cotton. Why? Uh, and opposed by most of the, you know, most of the government uh, employee, government officials, they couldn't understand why in Zhongrong chose cotton as one of the winner enterprise. But in Zhongrong knew textile industry very well because he, he was born up, born in Shanghai area, grew up in Shanghai. He knew the textile industry in Shanghai area and he personally um, been very close to many of the textile um, entrepreneurs who moved from Shanghai to Taiwan with Chiang kai -she. And they moved to Taiwan also with the engineers and the machines. So when people criticizing said that Taiwan market was too small for cotton industry and, uh, and, and that Taiwan was not able to develop any export market for cotton product, but in Zhongrong stubbornly pressed forward. He believed, he convinced that he made the right decision. So in Zhongrong, with the opposition from Governor of Taiwan, Wu Guozhen, Minister of Economic Affairs, Zheng Daoru, in Zhongrong insisted. So he negotiated with American aid team to formulate a contract called Textile Contract Policy, Daifang Daizhi, using U.S. aid to import cotton yarn and order the CTC, the, the Central Trust of China, which is equivalent to a uh, venture capital, the CTC to contract the local textile manufacturers to weave yarn into clothes. And the CTC helped sell the finished cotton yarn through state-sponsored agricultural and business associations. This is good business, easy business. Government provides subsidy. Government also provides protection. Government levy import tariff to provide uh, local productions. So textile industry grew fast. But in Zhongrong was very unique. Within 15 months, in January 1953, in Zhongrong stunned the industry by abolishing the laws of protection open up the market for Japanese, especially Japanese clothes and clothing. In Zhongrong said, there is a limit to how much state industrial protection should be granted to individual industry. And he emphasized that the government's goal was not to establish a greenhouse industry. So in the next six months, more than 50% of textile enterprises fell down, dissolved, failed. But the rest survived. And you all know that industry, textile industry, became one of Taiwan's most uh, leading industry uh, for export in the next 20 years. So this model in Zhongrong used command economy to choose a winner enterprise. Government planning, financing, technical support, and even with